Welcome to lab 6. In this lab, you will learn how to launch code reuser tags. In particular, you will focus on return-oriented programming, which is the most common exploit technique against memory safety issues. We have two learning objectives in this lab. After completing this lab, you will be able to recognize code reuser tag techniques. In particular, you should be able to describe how to write return-oriented programming. In this week's tutorial, we will guide you how to construct a very simple return-oriented programming from scratch. This is simple Stack Overflow vulnerability that we discussed in previous labs. To exploit this vulnerability, an attacker can simply provide a longer input than the allocated buffer. Typical target for shellcode were the input buffer and the environment variables in previous labs. However, when DEP apply, Attackers cannot directly execute the injected code since all writable memory regions are not executable anymore. Since we cannot directly inject the shellcode payload to the target, we should reuse existing code in the program. There are two popular techniques. First one is return to libc, which redirects its control flow to a library function such as system. Second technique is return-oriented programming, which can be considered a generalized version of return to C. Let's see how we can exploit this simple buffer overflow when DEP is applied. First, without DEP, the exploitation is trivial. Simply jump to the injected shellcode. However, when DEP applied, the program simply aborts when attempting to execute the injected shellcode. Indeed, it is easy to bypass the EP by using the return to libc technique. Since we can inject or uh, hijack the return, we can simply jump to system function in libc. Remember that in this x86 32-bit architecture, we can as well construct control each argument by crafting the stack. After placing the pointer to the system, we place a dummy value, which is considered as the address of the caller and we place the pointer to the bin shell string, which is considered as the first argument of the system function. What happens when system function return? It simply crash as the instruction pointer has the dummy value. Let's chain two functions in this way. We'd like to execute x is 0 after completing the system function. In fact, chaining x is 0 is not too difficult as we can control the next instruction pointer. Instead of dummy, we can put the address of exit. And as each argument, we can place the 0 value right next to the bin shell string as highlighted in the screen. Let's generalize this, uh, this idea further. In this case, we'd like to invoke three functions. Function with, with one argument, function 2 with two arguments, and function 3 with three arguments accordingly. Once function 1 is invoked, we can redirect its control flow to the next function. In this case, we put two arguments, argument 2 and argument 3 for function 2 as before. Then, how can we redirect its control flow to function 3? Unfortunately, in this way, we cannot further change its execution to function 3, as the slot for return address is already taken by argument 1. Return-oriented programming is proposed to solve this particular problem by generalizing the way we construct the payload. After executing function 1, instead of redirectly directly to function 2, we chain each execution to a set of instructions called gadget. In particular, we redirect each execution to pop and return instruction which allows to clear argument 1 and again redirect its execution flow. In fact, the payload structure now is exactly the same as where we started. Since we can hijack the return address, we can redirect its flow to function 2 with corresponding argument in the stack. When function 2 return, we can continue to hijack its execution to another place. Instead of executing function 3, similar to what we did before, we can redirect each execution to another pop gadget, pop pop return. By doing so, we can reconstruct the stack once more by popping argument 2 and argument 3. After executing the pop gadget, we can continue to chain our payload as before. 
Lastly, we can invoke function 3 with corresponding argument in the stack. As you probably noticed here, all the gadgets are ended with the return instruction, so we call return-oriented programming. To access the tutorial, you first have to log in to the lab server hosting the lab 6 challenges. So please find the exact information in separate materials. Once you log in to the server, you can find readme files under tutorial wrap directory, which describe the detail of each step that you should follow. In this tutorial, we enable DEP and ASLR in our system, so you cannot easily exploit the target program as before. You can check whether popular security mechanisms are applied or not by invoking the checksec utility from phone tool. To make our task easier, we intentionally provide data and code pointer of stack and libraries. To dynamically understand the structure of the stack, let's generate a cyclic pattern as an input to the program. When we provide this input, it crash because of the stack overflow as you expected. You can check each crashing state either by checking the message or by loading the generated core file. You can also easily check which input bytes affected the execution of the program. In other words, you can start constructing the raw payload to this program. Today's task is to construct a raw payload that chain three functions, open, read, and write. With this payload, you can read the flag file and leak the flag to the console. In summary, we learned two code reuse exploitation techniques namely return to libc and return oriented programming. These are so powerful that attacker can still execute the code as they wish without injecting the shellcode. Happy hacking!